Welcome to Dune Club Session 3. For this session, you should have read pages 106 through 165, and it ends on the sentence with Duke Leto thinking to himself, and it could be a hideous place. Previously in Dune, we have met House Atreides, the Duke Leto, his Lady Jessica, and their son Paul, as well as their inner circle, consisting of the Mintat Master of Assassins, Thufir Hawat, the troubadour warrior, Gurney Halleck, and weapons master Duncan Idaho, as well as the traitor, Dr. Wellington Yui, and their enemies, the House Harkonnen. Now on the Emperor's command, the Atreides have taken over the fiefdom of Arrakis. They have moved from their planet of Caladan to now mine the spice melange, the most precious substance in the universe on this desert planet. Now, it's a race against time for House Atreides to ally themselves with the native population, the Fremen, in order to have their help to evade the trap set for them by the Emperor and the Harkonnens. In this session, we see an attempt on young Paul's life. We also see that both Paul and the Lady Jessica receiving intelligence, saying that there is a traitor in their midst from both the Fremen people and a fellow Bene Gesserit, and we also see Duke Leto and his men working overtime to secure House Atreides on this hostile planet in this impossible situation. So now let's dive into session three. Now, one of my favorite pieces of wisdom in this book is found in the header preceding the first chapter of session three. And it says, Muad'Dib learned rapidly because his first training was in how to learn. And the first lesson of all was the basic trust that he could learn. It is shocking to find how many people do not believe they can learn and how many more believe learning to be difficult. Muad'Dib knew that every experience carries its lesson. And this lets me know that Paul is going to be learning a lot in the next few chapters. And for me as a reader to be on the lookout for him learning lessons. Now, directly after Jessica leaves Yui from session two, we switch to Paul's perspective and he's in his room, he's pretending to be asleep and he's thinking about sneaking out to explore his new house when a hunter seeker comes from behind the headboard of his bed. And a hunter seeker is an assassination weapon. It is commonly used. I mean, kids totally know about these, like everyone's schooled on this if you're of the royal blood. And it's this like little piece of metal, it flies around and there's an operator somewhere nearby, but that it targets moving flesh and will burrow itself into a body until it finds a vital organ and kills you. Okay, it's like a very gnarly little piece of work. And fortunately for Paul, he hears it and immediately stops, sees that it's a hunter seeker. And because it's kind of like a T-Rex, like it can't see you if you're not moving. Uh, he's sitting there and he's like trying to figure out what to do. And it's interesting because he thinks to himself, he's like, I could call for Yui and he would come in, but then it would kill him. And like, if he had done that, like, oh my gosh, like it would have changed this whole book, you know, but he doesn't. And what happens is that the new house, Fremen housekeeper, the shout out Mapes comes to summon him, opens his door and it goes after her and he catches it before it gets to her and smashes it. And something that I really love about this scene is the seamless blending of technology into the decorative elements of Paul's room. Because technology really isn't emphasized in the Dune universe as it is in our world. Like you don't want to see your thermostat on the wall. Like nobody wants to see that. And so in Paul's room, uh, he has this like wooden headboard that's carved with fish and waves and like all this cool stuff. And if you like push the fish's eye, it like turns his lights on and off. If you turn a wave, it can change the thermostat or the ventilation. Uh, and I was just like, man, it really, I can't wait till I live in that world where all of my tech is seamlessly blended in with the decorations of my house. Because I think technology by and large is usually ugly and obtrusive. Since Paul saves Mapes, this puts a water burden on her and she has to cleanse the way between them and decides to give him a piece of intelligence that the Fremen know that there is a traitor among them. They don't know who it is, but that it's someone close by in their inner circle. And so Paul now takes the hunter seeker and goes to find his mom to tell her the news. Now, another thing that's important to note about this chapter, and it's something that comes up later in other chapters in session three, is how the Atreides rely on the use of shields and their wits. And shields are essentially like a force field, 
you know, that you can put around yourself or your ship or whatever, and it protects you uh, from a lot of different threats. Not all threats, but generally it protects you. And so I think it's really interesting that the Atreides are more of a defensive house. You know, they're not offensive. They use shields and their wits. Now, happening concurrently during Paul's struggle with the Hunter Seeker, the Lady Jessica uses her Bene Gesserit lockpicking skills to enter a mysterious oval door which contains a wet plant conservatory that she estimates uses enough water to support a thousand people on Arrakis. And this shocks her to inner stillness. Because the Atreides may be a royal house, but they're not gratuitously wealthy. And she recoils when she is confronted with the wastefulness of this room, you know, and how it's this deliberate statement of power, you know, and it just goes to show her like how how much of a disparity there is on this planet between the haves and the have nots. So the wife of the home's previous owner is also a Bene Gesserit, and she has left Jessica a warning that even the Mintat Thufur Hawat, who's like the best, even he wouldn't find it, using coded dots on the stem of a leaf, telling her that she and her family are in immediate danger, that her son's life is in danger from a trap in a room built to entice him, and that there is a traitor in their inner circle. So just as Jessica finishes reading this warning, Paul barges in with the hunter seeker still in hand, you know, and she tells him like, put it in that fountain, you know, like make sure it's dead. And this tells Jessica that the message that she just read is truth. And both her and Paul discuss their separate warnings of a traitor. And it's interesting that Paul, again, like Paul brings up Yui and she's like, no, no, it's not him. And like, she's suspecting Thufir. So now we switch to Duke Leto's perspective, and there is a chapter header that I think is really important. And it says that, it is said that the Duke Leto blinded himself to the perils of Arrakis, that he walked heedlessly into the pit. Would it not be more likely to suggest that he had lived so long in the presence of extreme danger that he misjudged a change in its intensity? Or is it possible he deliberately sacrificed himself that his son might find a better life? All evidence indicates the Duke was a man not easily hoodwinked. And that's something to really think about in these next three chapters. Because now we're following him from meeting to meeting to meeting. The Duke is run ragged. He is desperate to secure this planet for him and his family. And he's having trouble managing his anger at the attempt on Paul's life. And while he's trying to manage this anger, he thinks to himself on the disdain that the emperor had for the Fremen and a note between the two of them. And the emperor called them barbarians whose dearest dream is to live outside the ordered security of the Fafferluks. Now, the Fafferluks is a rigid rule of class distinction that is enforced across the Imperium. And the essence of this idea is a place for every man and every man in his place. And this is something that the Fremen like do not really adhere to. I mean, being that they're not even on the census, like they don't even know how many there are. So, I mean, they're definitely like not a part of all this. And thinking on this idea, like the Duke reveals himself as a humanitarian in that his dearest dream is to end all class distinction, seeing the downsides of absolute order and admiring the wildness and the chaos of the Fremen and of his troubadour warrior, Gurney Halleck. Bearing our chapter heading in mind, we also hear the Duke thinking to himself that Arrakis is a hell that he's reached before death. And that tells me as a reader that Leto does know, like a part of him knows that he's doomed and yet he's still gonna fight on. Like he's gonna fight with every ounce of energy that he has until it's like game over, you know, it's win or die with him because there is always that chance, you know, and he's gonna take that chance. So now we have his meeting with Gurney Halleck. Halleck has just touched down, you know, I mean, he just got here. In fact, all of the Atreides just got here. Like this is crazy. And they're meeting up and the Duke instructs Gurney to go to these spice hunters. There's like 800 of them that are getting ready to leave and to use his powers of persuasion to try to keep as many of these spice hunters as he can. He wants them to stay on with House Atreides. 
And I love when Gurney's like, well, how strong persuasion, like, do you want me to use? And he's just like, dude, be chill. Like, don't, don't like kill anybody, okay? Just try to be cool and get him to stay. And I love that after his meeting with Gurney, Leto is walking to his next meeting and he stops and sees a propaganda man and they call him a propaganda man, which is like really what PR guys are called. Like we call them PR guys now, but really it's propaganda. And he tells him to spread word to the newly arrived men, like where they can find their women, if they had women that they brought with them. And also to tell the single men that there appear to be more women than men on Arrakis. And they're like, you need to tell them that. Maybe that'll help get their spirits up. You know, he's trying to like really hold this together and keep this ship as tight as he can. And I love when he's relieved when he gets some time to himself in the elevator. Like he stops and he can like drop this mask and return to his anger, you know, where he's like, oh, they tried to take the life of my son, you know, cause he's having to just like keep it together for everybody. And he says to himself that command must always look confident. All that faith riding on your shoulders while you sit in the critical seat and never show it. So now it's time for Leto's big strategy meeting. But before it gets started, he has a moment alone with Paul. And he's really upset with Hala. Like he's talking to Paul about how pissed he is, you know? And it's funny that Paul influences his father to let go of his anger towards Thufir for not uncovering the trap in Paul's room. Much like the Lady Jessica did with Paul himself earlier in the weirding room. And I just, I love that like how it trickles down and how Lady Jessica just really does have a lot of influence in this household. So now poor old overworked Thufir enters the room and he's alone, like all the aides haven't been summoned yet. And he comes to the Duke and he's like trying to tender his resignation, you know? And like the Duke is like, shut up. You know, it's blown right back in his face. Uh, and he's like, just call everybody in here. Like that's not even necessary, chill. And so all the aides come in and uh, and I love that Paul notices that his father says precisely the right thing in precisely the right tone to lift the mood of the group of aides that are also overworked, you know, like when the meeting commences, which harkens back to that header of like Muad'Dib is like always learning, you know, and so he's watching his father and he's like, sees how effective that is, like how you have to know the right thing to say in the right way, you know, to get your men on board. Because if you remember, the Reverend Mother told him to like make, you know, the art of ruling, you know, his science, you know, like, like get on that. And he is taking her advice. So one of my favorite parts in this scene is when one of the lower people on the totem pole complains about how there is not justice in what is being done to House Atreides. To which the Duke replies that they must win or die and that let us not rail about justice as long as we have arms and the freedom to use them. You know, it's like, oh man, like again, that echoes that other header of like, he knows the stakes. Like he, like Leto knows what's happening. And that's such a, fuck you beans. You can't do that when I'm doing this. You cannot use this as a scratching post in the middle of Doom Club. Let's go back. <laughs> Just let her do that. It's dramatic. I want attention. I told you I wanted attention. No. Now there's a lot of things that we learn in this meeting. We learn that the Fremen give their allegiance to someone called Liette, who may or may not be a real person. We also learn that the Harkonnens were banking 10 billion Solaris out of Arrakis every year, which is wealth that is unheard of in the Atreides household. Like they are not rich like that. And everyone's just like, what, wait, what? You know, like how much money were we getting ready to make potentially? We also learned that the spice mining equipment, the sand crawlers, the ornithopters, the carryalls that were left behind by the Harkonnens are mostly garbage. And that House Atreides will in fact have to take a hit on spice production and that the other houses are already not helping. Like just as Leto predicted when he was talking to Paul about what he thinks the Emperor and the Harkonnens plans are in session two. Like everything he thought was going on looks like what's going on. They also broached the problem of spice smuggling. You know, while this change of fiefdom has been going on, all these spice smugglers have been making a killing. 
and uh, they decide that he wants Gurney to contact these romantic businessmen <laughs> with an offer and tell them that the Duke will ignore their operations and let them smuggle whatever spice as long as he gets a percentage, as long as he gets his ducal tithe so that it's like totally legit and that they're wasting more money on trying to fight people than they would be if they just gave him a cut, you know? So it's like, oh, that's a great plan. They also plan of what to do about the Harkonnen agents. And the Duke tells Thufir to forge Harkonnen Certificates of Allegiance, which gives House Atreides the right to turn out entire families, strip them of all their property, take all of their money and all of their belongings. And this is a really ruthless move. Like this move echoes the Duke's father, the old Duke. And it causes a lot of disquiet between in Gurney and in Paul. You know, and Paul thinks that like, this is a bad move, you know, because if these Harkonnen agents see that there's nothing for them to gain by surrendering, that, you know, it's just gonna make them work all the more against House Atreides. Uh, and Paul is also thinking about Canley. And I wanna bring up Canley for just a minute. What Canley is, is a formal feud among royal houses, okay? It is legal warfare whose rules of convention are designed to protect innocent bystanders. And Canley is a fight to the death, okay? This is where each house swears to destroy its rival house completely. And when I say destroy it, I mean like kill everyone. Like either you kill everyone or they kill all of you. And that's what the Atreides are engaged with, with the Harkonnens. And this feud has been going on for like 10,000 years, okay? Like 10,000 years it's been going on. It's like really, it's like that. And in Canley, there is someone called the Judge of the Change. And in this case, you have the Imperial Oncologist Dr. Kynes, and he's appointed. And what the judge of the change is really like, he's like a referee, you know, he sees what's going on and he reports back to the high council and the emperor. Uh, and it's not only Can Canley, and it's not only Canley, it's also for changing of a fief or a war of assassins, you know, it's like, it's a whole thing. Now back to the meeting, Duncan Idaho enters in, you know, in the middle of the meeting, he enters in, we don't know where he's been. We know he's been with the Fremen, but we don't know exactly what's been going on with him. And he's like, oh, I got some news for you, Duke. And Duke's like, just tell, tell everybody, it's totally fine. And uh, he has this news that he and his men have taken a band of Harkonnen mercenaries that were disguised as Fremen, who had wounded a real Fremen courier who had sent to warn them of this fake band of fake Fremens. And that Duncan had surprised this Fremen who had been like mortally wounded and trying to throw away something. And it turns out that he was trying to throw away his Chris knife before his death. Like the guy knew he was gonna die. And the Chris knives are sacred to the Fremen, okay? Like, like the, the Harkonnens are offering like a million Solaris to anyone who can like bring them a Chris knife, okay? Because it's like anyone, like if you're not a Fremen, like you're gonna be murdered. They'll kill you if you've seen it. Like you have to be a part of their group to see it, all right? Like that's the deal. And they're very, very uh, careful of these objects. And a Chris knife is, a knife that is created from the tooth of a sandworm. And it has like this inner glow to it, you know? It's like really fancy. And so Duncan has this Chris knife with him. And everyone in the room, like they don't know the deal, you know? Like they don't know that it's like super not cool to look at it. And they're like, oh man, like let's, let's fucking see it. Like pull it out. And before he can, Stilgar, the Fremen leader that he brought with him, who's standing like right outside the door is like, no, like don't even like keep that knife sheathed. You cannot show that to anyone. Uh, and they were like, well, the Duke's like, well, what about me? You know, can I check it out? And he's like, I'll permit you to earn the right to look at it. You know, and everyone's like, oh my God, like, everyone's so pissed at the way that this Fremen guy is speaking to their Duke, you know, like they can't even with this. But the Duke like knows that he needs the Fremen. And so he's like, you know what? No worries, you know, like, you're right, like, don't worry about it. Uh, if that's your ways, uh, it's totally fine. Thank you for sending that courier. 
and let me know what I can do to repay you for the death of your your guy, you know? And Stilgar replies to this by spitting on the table. Like, spits on the table. And like, everybody freaks out. Like everyone's like, oh my God, what a sign of disrespect, you know? And Duncan's like, you guys, like stop. Like this is a sign of respect. Like you dum-dums, you know, stop. And they're all like, oh, okay, you know, and they calm down. But uh, after that point, Stilgar asks, because the Duke is like, well, name your price. Like, what do you want? And Stilgar asks if Duncan Idaho can enlist with the Fremen people. And, you know, Duncan's like, well, what do you think, Duke? And he's like, well, do you want to? Like, I want you to make this choice. And, uh, you know, he's like, well, is it okay if I have allegiance to the Fremen people and to the Duke? You know, he asks this to Stilgar, and Stilgar's like, there's precedent for this. You know, Liet serves two masters. And they're like, who the fuck is Liet? Okay, whatever, sure. And so Duncan is like now signed on with the Fremen. He's like, yes. And he gets to keep that blade. He gets to keep the Chris knife. So like, that's like his, he's now Fremen. He's got to go through some rites and shit. There's like a whole ceremony you got to go through, but like, it's totally cool. And now the Duke Leto has a man on the inside with the Fremen, you know, and this is exactly what he's been wanting. And so like, that's a real big, that's a coup for him. Even though that's awesome, this meeting ends on a sour note with a disagreement between the Duke Leto and Thufir Hawat over possibly raiding Imperial bases on Arrakis for materials to salvage and use to repair their own spice mining equipment. And Thufir's like, no, like, we cannot raid the Emperor's deal, you know? And Leto's like, fine, don't raid it. I just want to know if the bases exist. You know, he's like, okay, he calms down a little bit. But Paul watching all of this, he sees the desperation in his father. Like he's desperate enough to raid an Imperial base. I mean, that's really ballsy, you know? And he thinks to himself how his father looks like a caged animal. And he finally thinks, for the first time about the real possibility of defeat based on his own assessment of the situation. Not based on what Gaius Hel Mohim said, like not based on anything else, based on what he is seeing around him. He's like, man, we might be fucked. And so after this meeting, you know, it's like we got the, you know, after the party, there's the after party. And now we have Duke Leto meeting alone with Thufir. You know, all the aides have gone, Paul's asleep in the next room and Thufir tells him, and he's like really hesitant about this, like he doesn't want to tell him this piece of intelligence, but he's like, tell me what it is, it's fine, you know, have it out. And he tells him that they captured a part of a Harkonnen note from a courier, a Harkonnen courier, and it states that the blow will fall on Leto from a beloved hand, you know, which in Howitt's mind indicates the Lady Jessica. And if you remember from session one, this is totally a part of the Harkonnen plan. Like they are absolutely planting this implication to confuse Hawat and get him on the wrong beat because they know that they're gonna figure out there's a traitor among them, but they wanna point them towards the wrong traitor. And uh, and the Duke knows though, he, like he hears this information and he's like, he thinks to himself, what a slimy piece of business, you know? I mean, he's just disgusted. You know, he thinks to himself like, I know my woman, you know, I've shared a bed with her for 16 years. Like she, there is no way, which by the way, lets us know that Paul's 15 years old. They've been together for 16 years. So like they got together and he like immediately got her pregnant, you know, like that was the deal. Like, and that's why he bought her, you know, he bought her so he could have an heir and to wrap up this last meeting and the end of session three, how it also tells Leto the meaning of this word, Mahdi, that was shouted at Paul by the Fremen people when they arrived on the planet. And he tells Leto that there is a prophecy that a leader will come to the Fremen, a child of a Bene Gesserit, to lead them to true freedom, which follows this familiar Messiah pattern. And, uh, and Leto's just like so overloaded. Like he's so overloaded with so much information that he really can't do anything with it. And he's like, all right, thanks for letting me know. 
And he goes, uh, he goes back into the room where Paul is. He sees his son sleeping, and it's just like, okay, I'm glad he's not dead. And he goes out into the veranda, and he sees for the first time a sunrise on Arrakis. I mean, and that's how many meetings have gone on. Like he has literally, he gets on planet and has been going through meetings through the night until sunrise. And he thinks to himself about the beauty and the horror of this place. And that concludes session three of Doom Club. All right, guys, for session four, you're going to need to read pages 166 through 262. It's, a, it's gonna be a real chunk next week. And this session ends on the sentence, remember the tooth, Yui hissed, the tooth. So now let's open it up to live questions from our audience on the internet. Mm -hmm.